Welcome to the Chasing Brighter podcast, a show about self-discovery and lifestyle tips for moms. We are your hosts. I'm Kelly, a wife, a mom of two, and a small business owner in Chicago. And I'm Jessica, a wife, mom of three, and owner of my own outpatient mental health practice in Nevada. You're about to go on a journey of self-discovery as we chase a brighter you. Every single week, we will bring you new episodes that will cover everything from lifestyle and tips to more serious conversations about grief, life, and hardships. Whether it's a duo episode or we have a guest, you're guaranteed to pick up a new tool or feel less alone. This one's for the moms out there that have forgotten to make time to keep their spark alive. Allow this show to remind you to always keep chasing a brighter version of yourself. Let's get into it. In today's episode, we talk with Dr. Laura Deitch about teens and sex. This is her second time on the podcast, and we had so much fun hearing Laura's incredible tips and strategies for trying to create a sex-positive culture in your home. Dr. Laura Deitch is a licensed clinical professional counselor and clinical sexologist. She has her doctorate in human sexuality, and for more than a decade, has worked with diverse groups of people in the Las Vegas community on health education, social reproductive justice, and mental health issues. She is also an advocate for improving the implementation of sex education in Clark County schools. We loved chatting with Laura so much. We hope you enjoy this episode as much as we did. We're so excited to have you today. Yes. And I feel like for us, you're our all things sex guru. Mm-hmm. And today we want to talk about how to talk to our teens about sex and making healthy sexual decisions. Great. That's a giant topic. And when we say totally, teens, you can go anywhere from 13 to 19. So things are quite varied and have Absolutely. a lot of spectrums. I would say a good starting place would be And I did this all the time when I was teaching and I do it now with parents who have kids that I see in my practice, checking in with your own values. That has to be the place where you start. And so many times people, adults, parents, it's been a really long time, if ever, that they've identified, checked in and reconfirmed their own values. So what does it mean? And and is it okay to have more casual sex? Is it okay for same gendered sex? Is it okay for exploring and doing things that are a little bit outside of the whatever we call norm these days? So if a parent doesn't have their own values clarified for themselves, this is going to be a really big challenge. So I'd say that's the first place to start for parents is sit down with yourself. And if you're co-parenting or if there are other trusted adults involved, then get on, figure out what your values are. And you don't have to be on the same page because kids are going to hear and be influenced by lots of different values. So you don't have to be perfectly aligned. I don't think you can be like completely, you know, black and white, but so checking in around, is this a thing where it's important for our family values or our religious values that it's no sex before marriage? Is that a, a big tenant of your value system? Then that's a thing to talk about and talk about why and how, and that's strategy. Just don't do it is not a strategy. Yeah. Yeah. We, I read the abstinence or like the girls that took like a vow, purity pledge, a vow, an abstinence vow had sex 18 months later than their peers. So it just buys you some time. It's not going to be abstinence. And what I worry and wonder about, even had it been three years later, how they think about sex. Totally. 100%. Like, yeah, because mm-hmm. I'm just like, if it's this forbidden thing, yeah. how does it suddenly become a sanctioned? Yeah. No, totally. But just as far as if people who are doing that thinking, this is what we're going to teach. This yeah. is going to be, it's, it's not really stopping anybody. Like if you're thinking you're stopping people from having sex, you're not. Right. Yeah. When I think, I know we talked about it It was fascinating the last time we had you on and you said that Catholics were obsessed with teen pregnancy and it just took me like a really long time to, because Kelly and I were were raised Catholic in a Catholic school and it's, we are obsessed with teen pregnancy. And so when you say, what are your values around sex? I go to only my daughter, like only my daughter, not my boys and don't get pregnant. And I know yeah. that's my programming. I know that yeah. I can check that. But I'm just like, WTF, Laura totally said we're obsessed with pregnancy. Like, where the hell is this coming from? If we look backwards, if we think about it, it's not, if we tease that out, you can spread it. 
it doesn't, it, the intention, it doesn't come from necessarily a horrible or evil or malicious place. Because if you think about what does becoming a, a teen parent mean today, and historically it's meant other things. There was shame, there was excommunication, that kind of stuff. Today, it's financial instability, mm -hmm. it's career stunting, it's realities of child care and quality of life. So I get the whole, we don't want to have unintended accidental pregnancies, but that's a whole different thing than don't have sex because you might get pregnant and therefore that's awful. Like, yeah, what, yeah. Well, totally. Mm -hmm. Family planning and what does it mean to be a parent and what does it mean to raise a child? If you look at it from that lens and that focus, you, you accomplish the same thing without the negative stigma and without that lack of permissiveness around sex. Because it's not don't make out and don't have oral sex and don't have protected sex. It's don't have a kid that you can't pay for. Yeah. Those are things. Yeah. Because I think that can be a consequence of sex. Mm -hmm. But it's there are a lot of ways that you can have sex and sexual interactions in a protected, healthy way. And and I had read talking about gender that you immediately go to teaching your daughter about how to protect herself from sexual assault right. versus that it can be fun and pleasurable and exploratory. So okay. just being careful of our wording so we're not. Well, isn't that interesting? Sexual... Yeah, and isn't it interesting that we talk about talking to our daughters about preventing sexual assault but we don't really talk to our sons about not sexually assaulting no hello yes how do you prevent rape don't rape yeah yeah right yeah get consent it's become a very and i even and i don't know if we talked about this last time but one of the most interesting things that i saw that was so fascinating to me my first degree my bachelor's degree is in journalism i'm a like my i'm a writer i'm a journalist person and it's so interesting, the vernacular and the way that we talk about sexual assault and rape. And if you think about all the different ways, we talk about underage sex. That's called rape. We talk about child prostitution. That's trafficking. We talk about so-and-so was raped. That's passive voice. How about so-and-so raped this person? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Never do that. That's not the way it's spoken about. And it really does create this defensive... Mm -hmm. um perception of responsibility and it's like that those two things don't go together how can you be passively responsible yeah yeah and i think one of the things i had and i i think a lot of it is from peggy ornstein's book girls and sex mm -hmm. but about being assertive and i, I think yeah. we might have talked about this last podcast but like just being like knowing what you want and saying what you want and I think as women, we are raised, our culture raises us in a way that we need to be like nice and polite. And so I have for sure, I'm sure both of you have too been in a situation when I was younger where like someone was doing something I was very uncomfortable with, but I just smiled and didn't say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, thank you. Let's just not do that or whatever. So just learning how to be assertive and saying, this is what I'm good with. This is what we're not going to be doing and being able to put that into practice. And even taking it from a younger, like teen boy perspective where there's, I feel like there's more of a social like pressures or that's the other thing with my own kid, my, my two boys is like having them, if they're not comfortable with something to not do it and to even, I think that they Sometimes I feel like boys feel like they need to do something because that's like what everybody's doing. But no, and doing what you what feels right to you versus what you think you need to be doing. Because I think even my young, younger, like sexual encounters with boys, I don't even know if the boys wanted to do the things, but they felt like they needed to as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that it's pretty common in our culture for there to be this whole predator mindset or archetype and then the kind of victim or subject archetype and we've been pitted against each other yeah. we're talking about just the binary the gender binary and we women have been cast in the role of gatekeeper and we decide yes. who's let in and who's let out and therefore all the pressures on us and the boys or the men the males have been tasked with go get and it's 
it, it's as old as it, it's an ancient kind of concept, but it really does play out in a lot of media and a lot of the things we see. And going back to that idea of, and so practical tips, if we want to talk about parents, and I talk about this with my adult clients too, it's the same concept. And I think it's a really fundamental one. Before any encounter, figure out, ask yourself, what am I comfortable with? What am I not comfortable with? And mentally rehearse that. Am I okay kissing today or tonight or during this encounter? Okay. And make that decision and cement that in your brain. There will not be that, or there will be, it's okay if this happens. Am I going to, will I be disrobed? Am I going to take any of my clothes off? Maybe my top and not my bottoms. Okay. Okay. So figuring out like step-by-step, what is a yes, what's a no? And maybes are tough. And maybes I think need to be looked at really closely and say, is it really a maybe or is, or am I just afraid to say no or uncomfortable or unskilled at saying no? And that's where that assertive communication comes in. And that's where that fear of being a bitch comes in your violence comes in? Am I going to get pushed or bullied or hit or called a name if I say no? And imparting to our kids how to stand up for themselves and how to have that confidence in themselves to be like, this is how I feel. This is what I'm willing to do. Maybe even saying it ahead of time, saying at the outset, but you're not getting laid tonight. I've told my adult clients, you're welcome to say that when you go out with somebody. You know that there will not, this night is not ending in sex. I just want to put that out there. Yeah. If you still want to go out, I'm game. It takes so much pressure off of both people or yeah. Other people. Yeah. So yeah. that's a first step. And I like that. What do you think are good? I just, I want to go all over the place. So I want to go with the binary males in our lives. So Kelly and I each have two boys, and I totally agree because I, for various things, my daughter has been targeted with dress coding, even when she was like little. And they, and one of the reasons they said was because boys would look at her butt when she was like in fifth grade. And I went crazy. And I'm like, how about we teach boys not to look at her butt? Why don't we teach the boy? You know what I mean? So yeah, like a hundred percent, like teaching my sons about consent and expectations. And I think really, I'm so glad that there has, there's a push against toxic masculinity and we're talking about it so much more. Because I was even listening to this sex therapist and he was like, desire in his experience is like 50-50. It's not like men, oh, men come in and 80% of men want sex five times a week. It's 50-50. Like desire has nothing to do with With your gender. gender. And so Mm -hmm. just talking with our children about that, that there might be this expectation um, of you to behave a certain way. I don't know, addressing that head on. It's a matter of figuring out who you are, what goes back to those values. Am I a person who puts my needs above others or makes my needs equal to others or puts my needs below others? So figuring that out and you can see that people engage in people pleasing behaviors. I just want to be liked or I don't want to make waves or I want to be friends. I don't want to be cyber bullied, all that junk. And this idea of going against the grain or standing up. So if the pressure is go get and that those boys are like, I'm not, that doesn't feel right to me either tonight or with this person or at this time in my life, creating that space and creating that permission and comfort for them that they get to just do what they want to do. And if their friends have a problem with it, then they're not friends. Yeah. So that kind of thing. And that goes across all genders. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and so it's like, we, so we check our values. We decide what we think is appropriate. We talk with our child. And they look at their values and then they make their decisions. What are some, I don't know, I want to say like talking points or things that we can talk with our child about as far as like how they know they're ready? That's a great question. I think that's probably one of the biggest questions that has come up over my years. And the interesting thing is every kid is going to be different. And there is no magic number because I think we all know 45-year-old adults that are really not ready for a sexual relationship. They don't do well. It, that, that's so it's not age defined. Yeah. It has to do more so with your ability to identify your comfort, your ability to express yourself, your ability to be assertive. What do you know? What do you know about your body? What do you know about your comfort with risk? What do you know about access to health care and what feels right and what feels wrong? And how well do you know your body? What's your kind of moral and value around your 
about sexual intimacy and let's say faith or family values or introversion, extroversion, privacy, being all out there. I think those are a lot of the factors that come into play when a young person is deciding whether they're ready for sex. So looking at what happens if you find out that your partner has told 15 people all the intimate details about your experience together, how would you be with that? Because you can't control that. It's like, oh my God, I would want to die. Okay, then you need to establish a really nice sense of trust with this human and really feel like they are not going to do that. So it's, I think it's putting those, those ideas of trust and respect and communication into practice. Make it practical for them so they know what trust is, so they know what respect is, so they know what communication is and looks like. And that, that was even what I was curious about, too, is I know we jumped into sex, but like I have a 13-year-old son, right? So like he is at a stage where he's just learning to... I guess I'm going to say have a relationship with a girl or whoever. I have a relationship with a person that he likes and trying to how to nurture somebody to have that foundational practice of if you like a girl and they talk to you, then you continue to talk to them. If you don't talk to them anymore, then they assume that you don't like them anymore or just very basic stepping stones of things. And not that I'm like, ooh, you need, I, I don't care whether or not he has a girlfriend or a significant other, whatever it is, but it's more about like how to be a good, it's essentially how to be a good boyfriend, right? For mm -hmm. him, how to be a good boyfriend. And how do you teach kids that? How do you teach like whether it's a boy or a girl, whoever they like, but how do you teach them to be a good partner at a younger age? I think a lot of the opportunities for that is to use real life examples or out in the world examples mm. or things that, that are portrayed in the media and also flipping it. How would you feel if? So this is developing a sense of empathy and a sense of being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes, because as we know, that is a, a, a real stumbling block in relationships. If we can't ever consider or think about how the other person feels, it's going to be a tough relationship. Saying to your son, if, how would you feel if she never talked to you again? Or how would you feel if they never talked to you again? And he might go, oh, I would figure that they, did, they didn't want to talk. They didn't like me. So if you like this person, you need to continue to engage with them. And you can maybe if there are some television shows or YouTube channels or something that they watch, some media that you can mm -hmm. glom onto and sneak over their shoulder, point out. Like, that's a great example of, of good communication or, ooh, did you see what just happened there? If you spot a really neat example of mm -hmm. poor communication, you can point it out. Or if you have a, a thing with your partner in front of them, you can go over that later, deep beer fit with them and say, your dad and I had a miscommunication earlier and I want to explain it to you. And I'm not saying like spill all your guts to your kid, yeah. but if it was something stupid about groceries, something dumb, use those examples because they're real life and they can get the meat and at 13, they are still concrete thinkers. They're just starting to get into abstract thinking. So they need to be like, oh, I can like, they need the example, the chewable example. Okay. Yeah. I think those are some good things. Also, what does it look like? These are these, again, these are abstract concepts. Mm -hmm. Trust, communication, and respect are a little bit abstract. Okay. Respect to me is the biggest one that's abstract. I have a hard time. I think we all do. When you see it, and when you're being disrespected, but how do you define it? Yeah. And so looking at that and, and looking at examples of that and, and creating those teachable moments to teach about what does respect look like? You show up to your part. I, I have a thing coming up the end of September and my partner, it, it's not his gig. It's not his thing. It's not his world. But and we're new. We're six months in. And so I said, logistically, like, how are we navigating these kinds of things? I know you work in the evenings. And so I want to tell you that I understand if you're not going to be able to make it to this thing. And he stops and he goes, no, I will be there. It's important to you. And I was like, oh, and I'm like, oh, that was respect. Yeah. So like he would take the night off of work to be there for me because I have said this is an important thing to me. Mm hmm. So it's those examples of what does it mean to be respectful? Show up to the volleyball tournament, even if it's dear God boring, because your your partner play is on the bench and they're the losing team and they're only gonna just, they're gonna get playing time for four minutes, but you're gonna be there for four hours. You show up. Yeah. 
So I, like I think that. that's good. All those things. Yeah. So I think the other thing is when you're talking about kind of those beginning stages, right? The 13 year olds, the little ones who are starting to have relationships with people. It's, you know, how, well, what I want to encourage them to do gut checks. So is their partner exhibiting and doing behaviors that are making them feel yucky? Or are they feeling emotionally manipulated? Are they feeling cornered? Are they feeling like they have to defend themselves constantly? Because we want to be on the lookout for the unhealthy things in a relationship as well. So I think that's an important thing to teach both sides of it or all across the spectrum. What, what looks like a healthy relationship and what needs further examination to see if it's not a healthy relationship? I think that's really great to think about because it's really trusting their inner voice, trusting their intuition, right? And getting into the practice of knowing what that is. Going back to your point, like even a 45-year-old person sometimes struggles with that, right? And it's something that you have to keep practicing to develop that skill. And so at a young age, that's such an incredible life skill, right? To be able to have. I'm always like, so they, so we're at like a K through 12 school. And so my seventh grader and 10th grader are know all the same people. And so my daughter will always be giving the tea in the car about the various couples. So-and-so cheated on so-and-so. And I'm like, what's cheating your age? What's dating mm-hmm. your age? So what does that mean? And what does that mean when we're going out you're dating and your guys' age? What does that mean? And then they talk about it. And I say a lot to them, if it's not fun anymore, it doesn't feel good. Like, You don't have a house together. You don't have kids together. You're not like splitting bills. (laughs) If it's not fun, peace out. Maybe that's avoiding attachment. (laughs) No, I think it's great. I think at that age, that's appropriate because you're right. You don't have bills and houses and and crap together. So yeah, if it's not fun. I think also it it, it warrants, is there something to work on? Was it a little tiny thing that we can work out and work through and and continue the relationship? But if it's, it's a consistent feeling of it's not fun, then that's something to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. yeah, my my daughter's a is an empath and a communicator, and she's in a relationship. I think it's seven months. So oh. at fifteen, that's twenty five oh. years. Wow. Right, but it's so awesome to hear her talk. Even early on, oh, he would say this, and I didn't like it, and so we had to talk about it. About that, I didn't like the way when he would say that. Yeah, I don't know. It was like a nickname or like a little joke or something, and she was like. And we had to talk about it and I don't like that. And then she was like, and then I did this and he, we had a talk and he told me he doesn't like when I say that. And so it's just, I thought that was so cool. Look Great. Good job, mom. You guys. Well, being vulnerable yeah, my, to one another. Yeah, but the 12 the year old is, I'm never being in a relationship ever. So I don't know what we did to him, but, and I'm like, that's great. Do whatever, whatever. This is a, how old is the girl? 15 year old boy. 15. And a 12 year old boy. Yeah. That's like a seven-year age gap, really. That's a huge yeah. age gap. So he's sitting there going, what? Talk, oh, and then I yeah. get talking about talking and talking. Oh, but yeah. time, though, hopefully. That's, I just say that's great. And I'd say like, like, that's how you feel now. Yeah. And if you feel that way when you're older, that's great. But sometimes we change our minds, too. And that's okay, too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say so. But how, and then I think, like, how do we, when you were talking about our kids having those conversations about how they feel about their body or their understanding of health. What are resources and ways to help them access that information on health? So I think there's a really, okay, so basics is what they see in the home is going to have a huge impact. So body image stuff starts as young as two and three years old. And it goes across genders. But if we sit there and we look in the mirror and go, oh my God, I look awful. I look so fat in this. That is what our children hear. And then they automatically start going, I look fat in that. Like they mimic every, I don't have children, but I'm not an idiot. And I know that kids start mimicking. They repeat everything their parents say. So we have to be mindful of how we're talking about ourselves and our own bodies and our partner's bodies, other people's bodies. Oh my God, can you believe they're wearing that? No, what's wrong with wearing that? So everything we do, they're absorbing and they're making value impacts in their own minds. We have to be really careful of that. Then there's a matter of what is, what are our sexual parts? I love that you were talking about getting dress coded and all that stuff. Girls' bodies are so much more sexualized than boys' bodies from a young age. 
So we talk about the whole idea of a girl, a little person wearing a bikini and somebody going, that's not appropriate. Why not? What is it? What is wrong with you, the adult that says that five year old shouldn't be in a two piece bathing suit? What are you doing to that five year old's body in your mind? We've got to check. I'm telling you. So like I, first of all, know how many of us are and we always hate our bodies. And so I am like, I would love to be 15. If I were 15, I'd be naked all the time. Let me have my 15 year old body. And so for my daughter, I could like about bathing suits and all that stuff. I don't really care. I really don't like are your nipples covered the end, right? I don't want her to wear a thong, but whatever. And so like I bought her this super cute swimsuit and my mom was like, I don't know if she said it to my daughter or she said it to me. And I was like, I don't care, mom. Like, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not going to do that. She doesn't. It's just a bathing suit. We're not thinking about anything else. But it was like I I saw her generation freaking out and trying to talk to my daughter about it in a way, again, to protect her from rape because of her butt cheek show. She's sexual and I don't know, will be assaulted or something. I don't know. But I was just like, we're not doing that whole shame on your body situation that happened to our generation so much. But it is. It's hello. My boys are topless all summer and no one is like. Where are you showing your pecs and your abs? That's I, my eyes can't handle that. I go home and gouge out my eyes. Yeah. It's, I, I see it and I'm just like, mm -mm, we're not going to do that because I, and I do think this generation because of more size inclusivity yeah. is a lot less shameful about like only this size can wear this or only this kind of body can wear this because we have access to so many more things. Yeah, I think just not even being concerned about what others think, like going in, uh, along those lines, right? Just owning who you are, raising somebody who they don't spend a lot of time. I have, my two kids are not like me at all. I've tried to raise them to not be concerned about what other people think and to just be who you are and do what you want and obviously be mindful of others. But like that whole piece is interesting because it's I noticed even with Wes like he doesn't ever take his shirt off when he swims he always has a rash guard on but it's because at an early age I was like I don't have to put that much sunscreen on if he wears that all the time but and then you fast forward it and like his friends all are shirtless and he won't go shirtless and so then I'm like wow did that turn into some sort of a body image thing for him where he's like less he doesn't feel comfortable like not having a shirt on when he swims. So I'm assuming it'll eventually sort itself out. But like he, I, I worry about that too. Cause I never, I've never said anything to him, Jess. Right. That's I'm more my, I struggled with a lot of body image stuff. So that's probably always on front of mine with my kids to mm. be like, oh, it's interesting. And then it's crazy. My youngest has, has always said things like, since he was like three, like I'm fat, my belly, why is my belly fat? Just different things that we're like, where the hell is this coming from? And because little and they have little belly because you're two and a half, three. But he, he very much about weight and stuff. So it's just on my radar to just ask those questions and just talk about we're all different, right? Everybody is different. We all have different bodies and your body is just the way it's supposed to be. And look at all the things your body can do for you. I would be like digging into Wes and with the rash guard. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. And actually, that brings up that actually brings up maybe one of the questions, too, I wanted to ask you, Laura, which is to that point with his personality, he doesn't want to talk about uncomfortable things, right? Whether it's sex or body image or anything, or are you talking to a girl? Like, I can get enough, but I really have to pull it out of him. So what are some tips in terms of talking to teens or kids? How do you get them talking? I think, all right, there's a couple of different answers. And one of them is going to be kind of a dick move on my part is start when they're little. <laughs> so if it, and it's, and for some people, it's too late. But for the ones that are listening that, you know, have little people, start now. So the sooner you start and get those, you know, more, you know, open and awkward, whatever, you know, conversations going, the less awkward they are, because they're going to learn, they're going to be conditioned that it's not awkward. There's no awkwardness to it. So now if we're at a point where it's, please don't, then I think what it can be is do third person. What do your friends say about blank? Or do you know anybody else who blank? Whatever the topic is that you want to talk about, externalize it, make it third person. 
Or again, if you see it in media out there or out in the world, you can do that. What do you notice about that? Oh, I just saw this couple and I observed this. What do you think? What do you think about that? So you can do that. Another thing to do is, and I think that most, no, I really don't think most folks know this. I want to believe most folks know, but I don't think they do. Don't ever make it like the, we need to have a talk. Like, oh my God, that's like when the boss comes to us (laughs) and says three o'clock my office. We immediately freak out. We don't think we're getting a raise or a promotion or a commendation. We think we're getting fired. That's the same thing we're doing to our kids. If we're like, I want, we're going to, we're going to sit down at the kitchen table and we're going to have a talk. So don't do that. So make it as casual and breezy. Maybe do it so that you're not looking at them. You're washing dishes or you're driving or you're something, you're folding clothes or they're playing a mindless video game, but you're not interrupting their die video game. Another thing is you can say, this is really important to me and not, but, and I know it's hard for you. What can you think of that would make it easier for you? Let them set the rules. Let them tell you, mom, I don't want this talk to go on for three hours. Oh my God, it's not going to go on for three hours. You got it. What's your comfortable time frame? Whatever it is, you got it. Can we not do this right now? Can we do it on Saturday? Sure. Saturday we can do this, but we're going to do this on Saturday. Okay, great. What do they need? I'm not going to tell you. You're not allowed to ask me any direct questions about me or what I've done. Okay. To the extent possible, I promise to honor that. But remembering I'm your parent and if something comes up, I might have to break that that rule. But ask them what it's going to take because then you're also instilling that modeling and that idea on them as to advocating for themselves, setting boundaries, okay. creating bumpers for conversations and communication with everybody. Yeah. We have those. We Kelly and I both have the books. It's perfectly normal. Love this. And what I did, my my almost thirteen year old doesn't. I don't know, like to necessarily talk. I guess he is a talker, but whatever. He can set like a hard boundary, where I can't get in or whatever. So I just set the book. So they had the talk at school, whatever they were talking about at school. And that day I had asked if he had any questions or wanted to talk anymore, but his siblings were around and he was like, I don't want to talk about it. And then I followed up and he was like, I don't remember what he said. So then I got the, it's probably normal to get, and I brought it out and I was like, but you can look through here. And if you have any questions and he was like very uncomfortable and he was like, I'm not doing it. And I go, I'm opening it up. And I'm like, there, I don't even know this. I don't know. I don't know like everything. And this is new. I didn't even know this. First of all, that book is very comprehensive. And I was like, I don't know this or this. And so I'm like, I'm just going to leave it out. And then I left it out. And he was like looking through it for 30 minutes. And then I came back in and I was like, because he was like, this is weird, whatever. And I was like, well, do you have any questions? Or we talked a little bit. And then I was like, I'm going to go. It's back in my office. It's on the shelf. So if you ever have any questions or anything, you can just, here's where the book is. And <laughs> I think it's great. I think preps are great. And leaving things with them. So get another copy and just leave it in his room. Yeah. Yeah. So don't even make it so that he has to do any effort to come get it. Mm -hmm. Have it be more of a, like, there's a, if if you've got a really quiet, introverted, just shy kid, get a special notebook, a dedicated notebook. And you can, like, you write a, a fact or a value or a statement or find a little scenario and stick it in there. And then there's a, a signal of, I've left you a message. And then they know to open the book and the expectation is that they respond to it. And so far and I read it like any, anything, but that they see it. And then, so maybe that's a way with a really less communicative kid, less verbal kid. That's a way you can do it is have this secret, not secret, but private Mm -hmm. confidential book passing where it's an actual, or it can be an email thread or whatever works for your family and your, you know, technology status. But that way, or you can have an anonymous question box. I used to do that in the classroom all the time. And so the kids could, they always got a slip of paper, a little square, and it was just a big question mark. And you can write anything on it. It could be a comment, a question, a statement, an mm. opinion. And then I read them at the beginning of class. And if there were questions, I answered them. If there were comments, it was an opportunity for me to talk about language, talk about bias, talk about gender roles, talk about anything. So it could be, there's a question box and every Saturday, I'm just going to go through it quietly and, and then I'll, and you can talk about answers at some other time. So you can create those little fun game ways to do it. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And, yeah. and and again, I know it all starts at a very young age, but what do you think are some strategies or some things that we can do 
to help have a more sex positive household. Big things are about body shame. These are, these are, this is hard because it's a values thing, but if we're talking about sex positivity as a value, then these are going to be some of the underpinnings. It's not, oh my God, you can't see me. Like it's, no, I'm not saying everyone needs to run around naked in front of their children. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it's taking the shame and the punishment and the stigma and the, but it's, hey, I'm undressing. Can I have a moment of privacy versus what are you doing? I'm naked. Those are such different messages. One is about privacy and respect and boundaries. And the other one is about shame. So that's one thing. Another one would be making sure that we talk about sex in a positive way, like sex and intimacy and bodies can be fun and can be relationship enhancing and can bring connection and touch can be really nice. There are different kinds of touch. What are the different kinds of touch? How do you like to be touched? How do you not like to be touched? Not forcing anybody to go kiss grandpa, whoever, when he visits or grandma, whatever. You get to say no. Asking to give your kid a hug or a kiss. I, whenever I'm around a little kid and my, my friends, obviously they know me and they know how I am. But if I say, hey, can I have a hug? And the kid says, no, I say, okay, no problem. And that's it. And it's reinforced that it's totally okay for the kid to say, I, I, there's not one more, are you sure, please? Mm -hmm. Or, but I missed you. Never. It's okay, no problem. Or I might just say high five and that's it, or fist bump or something. But letting the kids know that they don't have to do anything with their bodies that they don't want to, and you won't make them either. I had one client who, it was a parent and a, and a daughter, and the daughter had been sexually assaulted, and the mom just wanted to touch the kid. Even when the kid said, please stop touching me, stop hugging me, stop reaching over and touching my leg. And it was a mom and a daughter, and I just, I couldn't understand how the mom didn't understand, dear God, your daughter was violently assaulted, and you're not respecting her body autonomy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what's happening? So I have that need as a parent that they're like, they're mine. I don't touch them without consent, but right, like, right, I, right. I know the need as a parent. Yeah. Like, you're mine. I made you and you're all mine. You're my whole yeah. little thing. And I can like touch you and hold you and hug you whenever I want because you're mine. Yeah. But, yeah, but, again, but you don't. Yes. Yeah. Be, I yeah. don't. And even I know I'm so overboard, but my kids to each other when they're like tickling or running or like my youngest is seven years younger than my daughter. So she's always like, oh, my baby, you know, like and wanting to hold him. And she and he's like, no, no. And so then it's he said no, or, and you're laughing and saying no. And so if you don't like it anymore, you need to make sure she knows because when you're laughing, it's confusing or like all of those yeah. different scenarios. But I do, I just want to say, I understand a mother wanting to. It's hard to, especially as they go through the life cycle when they no longer have a need to want to touch you. Want to be as affectionate. Or yeah. Whatever. And, but also, I can. I have introspection and know that's my need and I can get my needs met on my own. Well, that's why you got another puppy, Jess. That's why I got a puppy. Someone will snuggle me. Later <laughs> on, the idea that she'd been violently assaulted. Yeah. Me, that would be just like the peace back. Of course you don't. She's yeah. literally saying, stop touching me now, mom. And the, the woman would not remove uh, it. Yeah. It was like, God had to call her on the session and be like, you need to stop doing yeah. that now. <laughs> So with sex positivity, so talking about pleasure and talking about exploration, talking about different relationship styles, talking about what do we learn from the animal kingdom? What do we know about families? What do we know? I love that discussion about what does cheating mean? Because for some people, especially teenagers, adults too, hitting that like button on Instagram yeah. Yeah. or- They followed they, someone on Instagram. <laughs> they, you, yeah. Oh my God, that's cheating. Dear God, the world's ending. <laughs> so what does cheating mean? What did it make you feel? And let's talk about that feeling and that, those kinds of things. Having those conversations, I think, is a good idea to get them to, to be able to dig deeper and explore what is it hitting? Because sometimes we end up, it gets diverted. It makes like a squiggly path from the feeling to the conversation. You're cheating on me, but it's because I'm feeling insecure. <laughs> so now we're yeah. accusing and someone's going to get defensive. So. Sex positivity, I, I think, is in terms of gender identity, gender roles. I want. I think there's an opportunity to talk about what is what does dating mean? What does honesty mean in a relationship? What are your boundaries? How do you express them? 
what do you do when someone pushes your boundaries? What does that mean? Because I think people forget that there's a couple of steps to boundaries. Here are my boundaries and you draw the boundaries, but this is what happens when you break them and then sticking to that consequence. And it doesn't have to be, I'm never speaking to you again, or we're broken up. That doesn't have to be the boundary. It can be, we're going to sit and have a discussion and you're going to hear me out as to why that's not, or I'm going to take a break for an hour, a week, a day, or I'm not going to invite you to hang out with my family on the next holiday or something like it. Making sure that we enforce what that consequence mm -hmm. boundary breaking is, I think helps with sex positivity. Because if somebody talks about, I don't like X, Y, and Z sexual behavior and somebody does it anyway, that's a, bound that's a consent violation and a boundary violation. We need to talk about it's okay to say, I don't want to do this or I'm not interested in this. And that's helping with sex positivity and talking about what we like and what we don't like. So we, we check ourselves, we have these conversations, we work to have a healthy attitude towards sex and sexual intimacy, emotional intimacy with our kids. And then they come to you and they're like, I'm going to start having sex. And right. how do we help them access tools to stay safe? So what I want to say first is that if your kid comes to you and says, I've decided I'm having sex. I want you and if there's a partner to at some point in the next week, go out and have a major celebratory congratulations yeah. pat on the back because you've done an excellent job. You know? <laughs> not a lot of kids it's a are dream doing that. scenario. This is yes. a dream I'm scenario. like, that's parenting done right. But so I think it's more a matter of sometimes you find out or you have a that there. Yeah. yeah. Then they confirm. Totally. You know, they, mm -hmm. they do not deny firmly. Yeah. Then I think the thing is, I think it's okay to say. I would love to be able, if it's okay with you and with the boundaries that you set, I want to make sure that, that I'm here to talk about it and I will honor your privacy and your sense of self in, in terms of this, but know that I'm a resource, know that I'm here. You will, you will not be in trouble for coming and asking for help. You will not be grounded for asking for help. I am a safe space. I am a safe person. Your safety is more important to me than anything else. And so laying that out there, because so many kids are terrified, the, the refrain, my parents are going to kill me. My parents are going to kill me is the thing yeah. I hear from kids more often yeah. than anything. So what are we doing that's sending the message that we're going to kill them? And I don't yeah. really mean kill. I want to yeah. be careful. Yeah. Right, right, right. They're going to be in trouble. Yeah. So sending that message of safety and that it's okay and that there's permission here and no, no matter what, you can come to me. Then ye have to back that up. And that means taking a breath, taking a beat, taking a pause. When they do inevitably come and say, the condom broke, I need 50 or 80 or 120 bucks for plan B. Or I think, you know, so-and-so, you know, might have an STD and I think I'm, I want to go to the doctor. We can't go, I told you. you. You can't, you can't freak out. You breathe. You say, for, and here's the easiest thing, thank you. Yeah. If you start with yeah. thank you, you will reinforce a thousand times that dynamic of I am a safe person to come to. I followed up on my word. You took a risk. You'd say, that was so brave. So first I want to, we're going to deal with the problem or the issue in a minute. Thank you. That was so brave of you. And I really appreciate your courage and, and your trust in me. Then handle the thing. Because that creates that, that mood and that tone of, yeah, this is okay. It's hard and it's okay. Do we, and it's like where I think like in our generation, now what I knew because everybody was covertly having sex in our Catholic <laughs> upbringing. But I have friends who like knew to go to Planned Parenthood and get on birth control or knew how to access various contraceptive devices. Is there something we should be providing before our kids talk to us or what are, what's your thought on that? Yeah. Those are still really good mainstays and staples and everything is digital now. And um, Sex Explanations is a lovely YouTube channel that I think is great and it's very diverse and inclusive and it's called Sex Explanations. I think her name is, I don't remember, I don't remember the person's name who does it, but it's wonderful. There are lots of online resources. Scarletine is another one that has historically been a good one. It's, I think it's done out of Rutgers University. There are, Planned Parenthood still is a staple in many communities. And if not locally in person, then online. 
look at your local LGBTQ or your gay community center or whatever. They might have some really good resources. Look for gender affirming therapists like me, people like me who are going to have that opportunity. And I do that. I tell parents, I'm like, these are, I'm going to have these conversations with your kid. I hope you, I, I hope that's okay with you. And I just go into it proactively. I'm just like, I'm going to ask them about their sex lives. And I'm modeling like that that's an okay thing to do and that they have a safe space. Say if there's somebody else that you want to talk to, maybe there can be, if you have someone in your friendship circle who has an in as a medical provider or is in the sex positive community, say you can always go to Susie Smith, there, Susie, that's whatever, my, and give and put their phone number in their kid's phone and say, if for whatever reason, you obviously clear that with Susie, but <laughs> you know, it's always Susie. And I don't know a Susie. I do too. That's, I that's always fair. do. Su Susie and Tim are my yeah. go to. But so I think those are some good things. And then have those hard copy resources. It's perfectly normal, or it's not the store for the little or what. It's all the Roby Harris series of books, They're, those are wonderful. But have that stuff around the house. Talk about different kinds of relationships. Say, oh, I, there's somebody I know who is in a polyamorous relationship. Do you know what that means? Or just, Mm -hmm. Bring up those things, but make it not about them. And that way you're getting vocabulary and exposure. Ask them, what are the clubs at your school? Or what are, how, is, how are pronouns handled at your school? Have those conversations because then you're providing those resources to them by yourself being a resource and saying, I'm a safe person to come to. And I can talk about these things. Yeah. Cool. And I know this, I, this is, has to be a myth. Okay. But I can tell you as a parent who's working through her own stuff, and has a teen and teens, it's like there is a fear, which I know is irrational, and I need you to um, confirm this for me. Just as if you start talking about it, they're going to start having sex. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I start, and we, we've been having the pre-conversations and all the stuff when she was younger, but I remember reading all of these books about girls who's, and girls in sex, when she talks, there, there were girls in, in the story whose mother, primarily the mothers, talked to them about masturbation and gave them sex toys when they were younger. And it's, that sounds so great and sex positive. But then the other part of me is if I do that for my daughter and talk about masturbation, she's going to start masturbating and become really sexually promiscuous and start having sex all the time. So, <laughs> okay. so as long as we were born with digits, we already have sex toys. Yeah. Okay. So everybody's born with built-in sex toys. So we have that going. We start masturbating in utero. So talking about masturbation isn't going to start masturbation. It started before we were born. Little kids masturbate all the time. You know that. We've seen it all happen. So us talking about it isn't going to cause it. It's already happening because it's a biological urge. And I'm not saying 100%, but let's yeah. go with vastly overwhelming majority, okay? Yeah. What we're doing by talking about it is reducing shame creating a positive vocabulary and pathway of, and channel of communication around it, normalizing it, and creating a sense of comfort within our own bodies and selves that we're going to carry into our relationships. Because how many people do I see on my couch because there's so much shame around masturbation or even, especially even among my girlfriends, I can't talk dirty or I can't moan or I can't make noises. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Yeah, that shit came from when you were little yeah. and somebody decided masturbation is something that we're not even going to say the word. That's how shameful it is. We can't even name it. So we're all going to, most of us are going to have sex. Most of us are going to masturbate. Talking about it won't cause it. All it will do is enhance it, take the shame away from it, make us more comfortable and therefore be relationship affirming and enhancing give us a better sense of comfort and make us stronger advocates for our own pleasure and autonomy. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to bust that myth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got to put that there. I'm like, if I'm thinking it, a lot of people are thinking yeah. it. And I think that's so, a great question. Yeah. yeah. Think about the converse. So what you're telling me is if, if that's true, so for all the people, we know it's the vast majority of parents in this country don't talk to their kids very openly about sex very often. That's a fair statement. And teenagers are still basically having their sexual debut at 16. It's been a, a number that has not moved. It really hasn't moved. Kids, on average, the average age of, of sexual debut, that means first time having sex. I don't li like the, the terminology of losing virginity. It's an icky expression. Yeah. Um, is 16. So 
The vast majority aren't talking about it. Kids are engaging in sex by 16 years old. So did it work? I, I, right. Are they, is there a correlation? No, because there is a correlation with kids who have their sexual debut later or so they delay first intercourse and they're more likely to use protection. Those are the ones that have the more open communication with their parent or trusted adult. That is data. That is yeah. yeah. You want to look for things that are going to be preventive. It's talking about it more, creating access to care and self-protection and sex positivity that delays intercourse and increases use of protection at first intercourse. And I am telling you right now, we'll see like how it all pans out for us. But I am so awkward, but trying my best. Oh, they're not. My daughter's boyfriend was over and they were like snuggling on the couch. And my 12 year old is now all of a sudden obsessed with running down, trying to catch them. I don't know, whatever. He's <laughs> being crazy, right? And we have them in a main area. We have set some parameters on what we're comfortable with. And, and he was like, oh my God, why are they laying on each other? Like, why are they laying on each other? And I'm like, they're in a relationship and they're, that's where they are. And then I was like, instead of saying sex positive, I was like, we're a pro sex household. And then my husband was like, I'm going to die right now. And then my son was like, stop talking. And my daughter was like laughing. I go, I met like sex positive. We're sex positive. And then my husband was like, please stop talking. Stop talking. But I'm like still trying to go. No guys, what I meant is it's okay. And it's open. Everyone wants to die, but I'm like, I'm going to keep trudging through this yes. we're yep. not gonna have shame about it and i know i'm a big nerd and i'm embarrassing everybody we're like trying i'm trying so in that vein of what kids see and how the conversations are and parent modeling and all that stuff i'll tell you that i have a friend who is married so it's a female a cis female married to a cis male so a husband and wife couple who engage in a form of polyamory where she has a boyfriend and it's consensual and known and the three of them hang out and, and all the stuff. But they have between them, it's a second marriage that the husband and wife is a second marriage. And between them, they have four kids. So it's two boys and two girls each in the kind of stair step. So the, my, my girlfriend, her, the, the woman in this relationship, her daughter is leaving for college, just left for college. But recently just looked at her mom and said, I know that X is... I don't know if she said boyfriend. I know. And the mom didn't deny and just said, oh, oh, you do? And she's like, you brought him to my basketball games with dad. Like the, the kid was able to pick up on this. And th so the parents, and that was their boundary. The parents weren't going to sit their kids down and say, by the way, four children, your mom and dad are in poly. They didn't do that, but they also didn't lie and they didn't have shame around it. And let me tell you, so the girl, the daughter, the teenager who just left for college, identifies as gay, as a lesbian, and is in the relationship, in her second or third relationship with a girl. And my friend, the, the, the married woman, the, the, the mom, is, yeah, I don't think she's ever had sex with a boy. And I don't think that she wants to. And I have no idea. Oh, I think that there was evidence that there was a very positive and consensual, whatever sexual dynamic there was between this teenage girl and her girlfriend was very healthy and normative and consensual and lovely. And so, yeah, there's this polyamorous parents, a gay kid and healthy, good boundaries and consent. And I'm like, yeah, that's how it's done. Yeah, I yeah. love that. And I think like where I even say, like in the 15 years I've been a parent, everything's changing so much. And more and more of my clients are in polyamorous relationships and we talk about it. And then I can explain to other people because infidelity and a side piece is not a consensual no. polyamorous relationship. Like the people that I know they're actually in it, it's about communication and talking and your whatever. And, but anyway, but I think even that is in our language. I try so hard to be inclusive. And so it's just, like if you're able to talk about that and when you hear anything new and you're not like judgy and shameful about it, I think that does just have our kids feel they they can become more open-minded and then you're right. It's just, you don't have all of that shame so you don't have to be having speeches all the time right. but just when you talk in respectful inclusive language that can be a great result and I think my hearing both of you talk and I know you're both in the field too but I think as a parent that is our challenge right because we want our kids to be happy and we want them to navigate this world in a way that whatever their happiness is and what I'm hearing you say too is educating ourselves on 
these different types of relationships and what's okay and not having that shame. And it's really hard, right? Because we all came from this sort of like boy, girl, traditional way of doing things. And we're trying, we're open to this other world, but it's like not knowing how to necessarily be supportive, but not because I didn't say that you can't do that. I didn't mean that you shouldn't, right? Or whatever those things are. Making things less, so having open-ended questions. So not yes, no questions. It's so going back to even having the conversations and creating a safe space for kids to ask questions. Listen to the difference between these two. Do you have any questions versus what questions do you have? Because every kid, if you ask them, do you have any questions? No, they're not even going to let you finish asking. No, nope, they don't have any questions. What questions do you have? Then they have to sit and think about what questions because they have questions. Yeah, there's so many things that we can do and so many ways to navigate and create those opportunities for conversation. You can go back with your son and say, what's going on with you when you're tr when you come downstairs? It, it looks like you're trying to catch them snuggling. How do you feel about watching your sister on the couch with her boyfriend? Not are you OK with it or are you not OK with it? How do you feel about it? and keep it open so that he has the whole range of how he gets to decide how he feels about it and say, what's, you know, what's happening there? Not what are you doing or why are you doing that? Because that creates defensiveness, but what's happening? What's that about? So I think it's, yeah, I think there were so many, and then you can say, oh my God, was that not the most awkward, horrifying conversation that ever happened when I said, pro-sex and your dad wanted to die. We all want <laughs> laugh about it. Just go back and debrief it, deconstruct it and giggle because then it says like hard and okay and safe because when we're laughing, yeah. it's a lot safer. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it sounds like you're doing great things. And I think that there's a lot of things that parents can take from this and try like you. I, I love it that you said you feel like you're super awkward about it, but you're doing it anyway. Nobody does this with the grace of a gazelle. Yeah. No one. We are all going into this like baby giraffe. <laughs> so just know that if you're doing the baby right, giraffe right. thing, at least you're not the ostrich with your head in the sand. Mm, I like that. Good yeah. analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This was so great. I know I could just ask you endless questions and talk so much, <laughs> but this was so wonderful. Thank you so much yes. for taking the time to talk with us. I really hope this was helpful for our listeners, but you always have such great and tips and strategies and, and we love your perspective. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Appreciate being here anytime. Thanks for listening today. Don't forget to subscribe so you can hear our latest episodes as soon as they drop. If you love today's episode, please share with another mom. And while you're there, it would be great if you gave us a five-star rating and review. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to know more about Kelly and I, want to find more of our blogs, tips, tools, resources, check that out at chasingbrighter.com or engage with us on Instagram and Facebook at Chasing Brighter. Thanks. We'll be here next week.